The Palantir's back thesis has been questioned by many people as one of the biggest mistakes the company has made in the first couple years of being a public company. A lot of people have said, look, the SPACs really were companies they shouldn't have invested in. These were companies that were zero interest rate phenomenon. And essentially, the financial performance of these companies, as we're about to look at in a chart, have declined so dramatically that it's almost like negligent, oblivious, like what was Alex Karp and co thinking investing in some of these companies? Let's take a look right here. Uh, this is a screenshot from Bloomberg on the startups they invested in. Fast Radius, Story Group, Embark Technology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of these are down on average 80 to 70% uh, from their uh, their year highs. And this was all because many of them spacked in 2021 at around $10, $15, and they went down a lot because the macroeconomic environment changed. The companies did not have business models that were resilient enough to withhold those. Even a company like Weijo that I really enjoyed. I mean, I know the CEO, know the founder. I've spoken to them. They're in the automotive data space. Even they are getting delisted from the stock exchange because they have not been able to keep their stock price over a dollar, which begs the question, why did the company invest in SPACs? I mean, what was the reason for this? Like, what was the logic going on in their head in 2020 thinking, oh, let's give a ton of money. I think they invested uh, upwards of $300 million into a bunch of these speculative, I mean, really speculative plays. Some of them showed a lot of promise, but they were very speculative. And the idea was, yeah, they're going to use our software. They're going to pay us a little bit of money and we're going to have equity stakes in them. Even the revenue stream that Pounder has been able to make from these SPACs, being able to pay them for their software, which is reasonable because, you know, if, if you're going to do something like Lilium, for example, that uses a ton of data uh, to be able to build out these electric jets and be able to make sure that the processing speeds for those electric jets are meaningful enough, then if Pounder invests in you and you could benefit from their software, then you could pay them for their software, right? There, there is a reasonable exchange there. The losses that Palantir has taken on their portfolio from writing down the SPACs, selling off some of their losses that they have in the company, I think it's upwards of two, three hundred million dollars, which is equivalent to what they invested. And the money, the revenue they got from these SPACs doesn't even equivocate to the fact that they've taken losses in the overall positions that they had from investing in these SPACs. So the SPAC thing has been a disaster, been a failure. If you think about it, just by the numbers. There is a reason, and I, I'm calling it a secret reason because many people have not talked about this. In fact, I've, I've seen no one talk about this, and if they have, I guess I've just missed it, for why Palantir invested in the SPACs. And this is one of those reasons, yes, I'm going to say it, it's a bit of a more philosophical reason for why you have to accept the SPAC debacle that happened. Now, before I get into this, in terms of the overall financial performance of the SPACs, it really doesn't affect the company anymore. 2.9 billion in cash, zero debt, gap profitability, onwards and upwards, AIP, right? We're moving into a new chapter for the company. So the SPACs was a one-time thing. It kind of messed up. They took some losses. Overall, it did not destroy the company. I mean, they didn't invest that much to the point. It's not like they put a billion dollars into these companies, but it definitely wasn't the best thing. And it would have been better if we had not invested in those companies and been able to use that money in a more strategic way. However, we did. And I think although it will be seen as a red flag for the company, although the bear reports will be saying, look at what Palantir did with these facts, uh, it's actually one of the things that is the most important thing for them to have done, especially if you believe in a founder having control over their company. So what's the secret reason for why Palantir invested in the SPACs? Let me take you to one website. And before I get into that website, first, Sonny Coates, this is the guy who DM'd me about this. He gave me the tip on this. Uh, definitely check him out. Awesome Twitter. He's a heavy Palantir investor. And he let me know about this thing that existed, which led me down the rabbit hole of doing all the due diligence to come up with this reasoning. And it actually made a lot of sense once I looked at it. So here's the website, Cademon Group www.cademongroup.com, strategy and capital consulting. Uh, their offices are in New York City. Their email is information at cademongroup.com. They also have an office in London. So what is the point of this little blue website? It's a pretty stale website. Even the font is not that interesting, kind of blurry. Why does this website matter so much? Well, Alex Karp's last name or middle name is Cademan, Alex Cademan Karp. There we go, Alex Cademan Karp. Oh, he was born in October. I didn't even know that. I was born in October. Oh, that's, I was born October 27th. I don't know. Alex Cademan Carp. Now, why is this important? The Cademan Group. Yes, there is a relationship between the Cademan Group and Alex Cademan Carp. But what is that relationship? Let's go to a Forbes article back in 2013 explaining this relationship for this to make a lot more sense. 
With no desire to practice law, Karp went on to study under Jürgen Habermas, one of the 20th century's most prominent philosophers at the University of Frankfurt. Not long after obtaining his doctorate, he received an inheritance from his grandfather and began investing it in startups and stocks with surprising success. Some high net worth individuals heard that this crazy dude was good at investing and began to seek his services, he says. To manage their money, he set up the London-based Cademan Group, a reference to Karp's middle name, the same as the first known English language poet. So for those that don't know, Carp got an inheritance from his grandfather. Carp was successfully invested in startups and stocks after receiving an inheritance from his grandfather. And that what le- is what led him to found the L- London-based money management firm, Cademan Group. It was also a VC firm. Now, why does this matter? And how much was the money from his grandfather? I would imagine it has to be in the millions if you're investing in startups, right? Especially if you're managing money, you're setting up an entire firm. So let's, let's assume it was a couple million. Now, why is this relevant to him setting up the Cademan Group? Well, the reason he set up the Cademan Group at the young age of, I think he was maybe 25, 26, 27, something like that, which is a pretty young age to be managing a substantial amount of money, much less be able to take speculative bets on different companies. The reason he did that is because Carp inherently had a little bit of a knack for seeing success in early stage companies, which is a very good, difficult thing to do. I have a startup right now. We've raised $300,000. You guys can check it out, link in the description. And it's really hard. It's really, really hard to build a startup. And you know, as much as potential as there is, it is incredibly difficult to get that idea out into the world. So with startups, it's really like one in a thousand. And if you get it right, it obviously can go to the moon because you actually figured out how to build something meaningful, but it's not the easiest thing to do. Carp developed a reputation around London and ultimately where he graduated from Stanford as being the guy who had a knack to understand how to find these not even undervalued companies, these companies that had zero value, but had an interesting founder, had an interesting team, had an interesting dynamic, had an interesting business model, and then plow some money into them. Now, I don't know which startups he invested in. I tried to look over the internet. I couldn't find the exact companies that Cademan Group has invested in. But let's just say he made a bunch of angel investments, VC investments into all these little startups, and that yielded him massive amounts of success. The reason it yielded him massive amounts of success is because he was getting clients. And these clients, as you saw in the article, said this crazy guy is having a ton of success success knowing how to invest. And those clients were piling more money into the money management firm. I went through numerous articles on the internet, and pretty much every article I see, a couple that I show today, say that Carp was indeed successful at investing in these early stage startups with the money he got from his grandfather's inheritance, which led him to set up this money management firm called the Cademan Group. Now, why is this relevant to the SPAC debate? And this is my philosophical sort of argument for why I think it's important they did the SPAC stuff, even if they messed up. Alex Carp has founder lead shares, founder class shares, F class shares, same thing with Peter Thiel, right? And Carp and Co. have been very sort of stringent on the fact that they don't want to give up their um, power over the company because the company is so powerful, the company is so unique that if you have some regular suit come in and try to manage the company, they might say, hey, let's sell to Russia and China. And Palantir, Alex Carp, Peter Thiel have always been diametrically opposed to that because the whole idea has been that we're building software that should give America and the West a competitive edge, not our adversaries. So that's one of many examples that showcases why they went public with these F-class shares. The S&P 500 committee that rules over which companies get included into the index changed their rules just a couple months ago to allow companies that have F-class shares as the majority of the founder shares to still be eligible for the S&P 500, which didn't used to be the case. So Carp wasn't changing for the S&P 500. He wasn't changing for investors. He was going to let the world change for him because he wanted control over his company. Now, there is something in Silicon Valley around founders having stock in their own company and founders holding their own shares. I mean, like at the end of the day, I love Anthony Noto and he's a great CEO on SoFi, but he came and he started managing SoFi. He did not find the company. So when he buys shares in the open market, a lot of people are like, well, why is he buying shares and Carp is not buying shares? One of the reasons, because he doesn't have as many shares as Carp because Carp founded the company, right? Carp owns 3% of the company. So Carp doesn't feel this sort of obligation to prove to his investors that he's all in on the company because he founded the whole thing, right? He's always had these shares for a long time. As a result of that, When you're a founder of a company, especially in Silicon Valley, some of the best companies we see are led by founders. Jeff Bezos with Amazon, Mark Zuckerberg with Meta. I mean, there's countless examples of people that have had an idea. They took that idea. They went through like hell and back to get that idea out into the world. And they built a pretty successful company. Palantir's Alex Karp with Peter Thiel is no difference. Part of the reason I think the SPAC debacle was important and it was an important phase for the company to go through is because ultimately it was Karp being a founder. If you look at the history of Alex Karp, he invested in startups in his early 20s or or late 20s, early 30s with the money he got from his grandfather, and he did it successfully. So 
he felt he had some level of intuition to be able to find interesting companies that are doing incredibly interesting things, odd, eccentric things, give them 25, 50K, 100K, and turn that into a couple million, right? Or whatever, however many returns he got. That same philosophy, it seems like translated into the SPACs. Now, I started off this video by saying, look, the SPACs were, were, were a failure. They were kind of a mess. And like all, all these investments have pretty much gone to crap. I mean, maybe Tritium survives, Weijo survives, Lilium survives, you know, uh, Black Sky maybe survives, but the far majority of them have, have gone to zero or are going to go to zero. Uh, Carp, it seems like, still invested thinking they have a shot. And I think the reason he invested thinking they have a shot, even though in the back of his head, he was like, they're probably going to go to zero, is because... That's what you do when you're taking these odd, weird bets. If anything, Palantir is the weirdest bet you can imagine. I mean, take think about how many people it takes to try to understand what Palantir does as a company in order to even make sense of it. Palantir is a weird contrarian bet in and of itself. And so Carp is one of those founders that because of his past career of having success with investing in startups, I think maybe, this is my hypothesis, he proposed the solution or the 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 situation for them to invest in these SPACs knowing, and remember Palantir hedged by buying gold in August, 2021. So, I mean, they, they kind of knew things were not going as well as, as they could have, uh, but they still bought SPACs in 2020. So even though we were kind of in a bubble with COVID quantitative easing, you know, interest rates being zero, they still made the investment because I think Carp couldn't let go of his founder led instincts, which is even though the macro probably doesn't support us putting $20 million into a company like Embark Trucks, Let's still do it to see if they figure it out. Now, you can say as an investor from a pure rational perspective, that's the wrong thing to do. You should be looking at the numbers. You should be looking at the macro. You have to care about shareholder dollars, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I would agree with you most of the time. My pushback is that when you run a company and you're a founder of a company and it's your company, you usually know what's best. And I know there's a lot of people that say, but like, Palantir's got profitable. The only reason AIP is working as Bank of America upgraded their price from 13 to 18 yesterday is because of the ethical constraints to implement AI, the security privacy data constraints to implement AI into an organization that Bank of America is now realizing, holy crap, Palantir is one of the only companies in the world that can safely implement AI infrastructure into an organization that is part of their moat, which is why they gave them such a premium they did yesterday on the price upgrade. Who's been talking about data privacy and security for the past, forget, you know, two years, 20 years? It's been Alex Karp. And so when you have a, an investment in a founder-led company, you're investing in the founder at the end of the day. That doesn't mean every investment is going to go perfect. But if you take a bet on the founder, you got to live with the good and bad. And I think the great with Alex Karp is obviously this philosophical understanding of data that then leads to his clients being able to benefit from that philosophical understanding because the technology is infused with that philosophy and it results in some really fundamentally amazing tech. Some of the bad is these rants he goes on, these tangents, and potentially some investments he may make because his entire past was rooted in starting a VC fund with the money he got from his grandfather investing in the most odd eccentric companies and they worked, he was successful. He didn't end up being as successful investing in the public markets, given the macro, given interest rates, given these SPACs probably weren't meant to go public, but he still did it. And the reason my conclusion is that the SPAC debacle was not a failure is because if you're investing in a founder-led company, You've got to let the founder do what they do. And they're going to make some mistakes. I mean, Google has a VC fund. Salesforce has a VC fund. Oracle has a VC fund. They invest in thousands of companies a year. And a lot of them go to crap because in making a startup successful is really hard. But nonetheless, they still make the investments because that's the beauty of American entrepreneurship, right? Is like you take the risk. That is the American dream. You let someone take a chance. You say it's okay to fail in this country. We will pick you back up and you can try again. And I think Carp really embodies that thesis, embodies that aesthetic. And as a result of that, maybe it was his decision to do the SPAC investments in 2020 based on his previous past of being a capital allocator in the VC space. I also think this is why Peter Thiel picked him as the CEO, because Peter Thiel probably did some reading on Carp and realized he manages an entire firm's worth of money in London and New York, which is also why Palantir probably is so excited to have their European headquarters of AI in London. Carp obviously has some deep roots in London because he was managing money for clients in London. And Peter Thiel, one of the greatest capital allocators, venture capitalists of all time, is probably like, this is a guy that I want to run this company because he's not afraid of making a different contrarian bet. Not all those bets are going to work. Peter Thiel has investments that have failed, but the investments he's made that are correct, like Spotify, Meta, you know, there's tons of others, uh, Andrill Industries, they're working for a reason because Peter Thiel was able to see something that other people did not see. And as a result, I mean, if I'm Peter Thiel and I have to give the head of the ship of this really contrarian company to someone that I believe can manage it, can actually, you know, 
like 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 embody the ethos of what we're trying to build i would pick a capital allocator that has been successful in allocating capital to odd eccentric companies not just some money manager in the markets but someone who's actually investing in early stage startups that has to take a bet take a belief take a vision you have to take a risk someone like alex carp so this kind of goes circle you know it comes full circle for why peter Thiel picked alex carp but also my ultimate you know thesis here is that at the end of the day, even though the SPACs have failed and some of them may, may still survive, you got to let a founder do what they have to do in order for the company to become what you, if, you, if you're going to live with the good of Palantir, you got to live with some of the bad. And that's just what it's like investing in founders. People who are investing in Meta, he, look, Zucks wants to make a Vetiverse. He's putting up the numbers on the advertising front. He's getting more lean and more efficient. So, you know, you, you got to deal with that, but you also got to deal with the losses they're taking in the Metaverse because that's his vision. And who are you to say that that vision can't happen because he took this little social network and turned it into something that 3 billion people use. And so at some point, you got to give some credibility to the founder, let them do what they got to do. Ultimately, I don't think the SPACs were a failure because I think Carp was following his founder instinct, even if it led to losses. That is the result of investing in a founder-led company. And you just hope they are more right than they are wrong when you're making these types of investments. And if you want some cookie cutter board CEO, then yeah, go invest in one of those other SaaS companies and you know hope their out-of-the-box software does something special. If you want something that's transformational, you got to live with the good and bad. And in that case, uh, that's where you got to live with what happens with Alex Carp and Palantir. Those are my thoughts. Thanks so much for watching. Let me know your thoughts on the SPAC debacle or potential non-failure from Palantir. Thanks so much for listening and watching. I'll see you in the next one.